it. Yep. Behind yeah, that. so uh, evening everyone. Uh, my name is Chung. I'm a, currently a front-end engineer in Xylem, where I do uh, client-side web application with Angular and TypeScript. And uh, today I'll talk a bit about my uh, recently right, published repos repos repository on, on GitHub that uh, we well, lucky got uh, a bit of uh, attention from the community. And uh, like in the time of said, it has uh, 900 stars. So if you guys can make it to 1,000 stars after this talk, I would love to, to see it. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> if I can see some of my stuff, I, I share it on Twitter. Like, uh, follow this. Um, actually, I can first share the slide with you guys, so maybe you can uh, revisit it later. Okay. Oh, sorry, I just don't know how to check. Yeah. So that is the slide link. I save it with uh, everybody. Uh, okay. So let's continue. Uh, so the agenda today is uh, what is the, the repository that I, I published and what is, uh, so the name is Angular Jira clone. So it is the clone of uh, uh, Jira with uh, written in Angular. And what is the mo motivation behind that? I'll share a bit of, about my uh, architecture when I start to build the app and uh, some of the decisions why I, I building the app. And uh, mostly it's focusing on the CLS, the Tailwheel CLS, uh, a bit of stage management with NGX or Akita, and uh, the way I deploy it to Nellyfy and Heroku. Uh, after that, we'll have some short uh, Q&A session, and uh, just give me any question that you, you you might have during the slide, the presentation. So let's start. So uh, what is the Angular Jira clone? So there's a URL. You can click, and you can see it at jira.chunk18.com. And what it is is just basically a simplified Jira clone, and uh, we'll build it with uh, Angular 9 at the time that I wrote the code. And uh, I will try to make it like an example of a uh, modern and real world Angular code by because I saw there's a lot of example out there, but it's work pretty simple when the guy was building with Angular. So I also can share the link with you guys. So that is how it looks like uh, on the link itself. So uh, you can basically do some kind of simple stuff like drag and drop ticket, and uh, you can open it. You do a bit of uh, assign the ticket kind of stuff. Uh, you can also view all of the detail by just reusing the same component with the same view, basically. Uh, if you go back, uh, maybe you can do the create issue with uh, the issue. So just putting some simple description. And you have it. And uh, what else? There's the search and there's yeah, some basic functionality. But the highlight is uh, basically the bot of Jira. So if you look at the the board on, on Jira, this is how it looks like. It is my company uh, stuff, so don't uh, take any screenshot there. And they have much more stuff, obviously, but um, I will try to make it quite you know identical uh, somehow, but yeah, still there's uh, there's not like exactly hundred percent the same. And let me go back to the slide. Yeah, so this is a Yoya, Jira.chunkayatin.com. You can go in and, and take a look while I present it. And it's just the gift that I uh, I do before, the, what I just show you guys. So the motivation behind it when I start to work on the Jira clone is, I saw quite a lot of uh, cool stuff that we with uh, React or Vue.js, mostly all of the interactive, and um, I don't know if there's a lot of game and stuff like that, but with Angular, there's not much on the GitHub, or maybe I haven't seen it, but yeah, from my point of view, there's not a lot. And all of them was just very simple, just the list view or like to do list, which is not really like something we do like on the day-to-day -day work. Uh, I also wanted to experiment what I wanted to try with Angular for a long time. So Akita is like the stage management library, which make the process of managing the state is much simply then if you're using uh, NGIs, um, Tailwind CLS is more like a CLS framework, Antility, like they have one of the classes for you before, so you can just use it. Uh, we can talk about it later uh, on the slide. And NGDraw is like the end design. 
uh, that provide a set of components to build a web application. And also when I build Jira, I want to also demonstrate a bit of my experience after working with Angular for four years. So at least I, I, I have something and I can build uh, an application, which is hopefully is quite complicated, yeah? And uh, I wanted to feature it in our technical series about 100 days of Angular, which we, my friend, like there's some of my friend and I, we, we were written about um, how to use Angular and how it's like shaping the web application in 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 uh, real life. But it is at the moment it's sorry it's only available in in Vietnamese. So uh, and we don't have the efforts to do it in English very soon. The technology stack behind is I I see the project with Angular CLI, which is just a command line interface to uh, create new uh, Angular application easier. Instead of you have to copy all of the file over, you just do run a simple query and it's, that's it for you. Akita is, yeah, we'll talk about it later. It's basically a stage management library. Next.js for, for some uh, basic API query. But recently I removed uh, Next.js, like I just stopped it. Because the I deployed Next.js to Heroku and uh, sometime like uh, Daniel said, if the, the 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 server is not like wake up, it will take a while to uh, start at the at the beginning, so it's uh, slow down the application. And I should replace it with just static JSON file hosted on Netlify. Well, there's some UI module for like Tailwind and and the CDK for drag and drop module, and uh, NJSQ for the text. Editor, and that last is the Netlify to deploy the app to host the app. So we look at the high level design. It's like for every Angular application, always has at least one module. For either is it like a, a simplest app in Angular has always has at least one module, which is app module. So also in my project, it is the the root of the, the everything. And I also have some core module, which is like authentication or um, like other thing. Also, um, when I break it down, it is like when you go to the to the website. When I select the project, it will actually load the project module, which is this project module. It will, it is not like load everything in in one shot at the beginning. So it's just try to save and speed up the application at the load time. It goes the same for a login module, like you, when you want the user to enter the credential to uh, start to use the app. You don't want to, at that step, to load the project module. But you, of course, you can start to do prefetch in the background. And also, uh, in the background is my wife. She's uh, standing there. Uh, uh, also, in, uh, there's a Jira control. So basically, in Angular, when you need to use a component, it is not just like from a component, you import another component like React.js. You also need to import it into the module before you can use it. So for a set of common components, what you can do is you can have a, a like share module for a control. So in the Jira control module, it's basically like the a custom button or like custom text box. So I have it uh, here so I can share the code a bit. So let's go into the uh, Jira clone. So like you see, there's a app module which import some of the needed Angular module. Like by default, I have to import it to use app. And because Angular is a framework, so this has a lot of built-in, like HTTP or to work with. Oh, sorry. I also need the yeah Jira control for some part of that, and the rest is some of the uh, stuff that I need. So you go to the project module, you can see that I also import a lot of components. And also, there's a lot of module that I need to use on the board itself. And uh, like I mentioned, I also imported the Jira control module. Because in Angular, if you need something, you, you need to import it. Like you import it on the app module already, but it's not enough. You need it in the project module. You also have to import the yeah the the module into the, the the actual module that you need to use the code and also like the login I also need to import Jira control just to have some kind of text box 
Uh, yeah, I think that's basically this. So we go to the next slide. So um, we had a scene uh, when I start to build the layout. I start look into some of the maybe I need to just start to write the code from beginning with all of the flex layout. But I saw Tailwind, and Tailwind is basically is an utility CSS framework for really like building uh, uh, design like fast. On the screen, I have uh, a GIF. So basically, uh, Tailwind has prepared all of the uh, Atomic CSS class for you. Let's say you want to have the margin top with five pixels. They have it M um, desktop, that one, for example. And you don't really have to extract it to a new classes and you need to write CSS from scratch. And we will talk about it a bit later. Uh, maybe, yeah, actually, I can say some of the Tailwind like, in action, but okay, maybe we just show it later. So, why is Tailwind? Like, like I said, I always have the use case where I need to do just a little bit, like just one line of CSS, and if I need to break it into the class, it can be a lot of effort. I mean, I don't know, I, don't, I just don't like it a lot. Like, if I have the cursor pointer and I need to use it in one small element, if I want to, to break it into a class, it will be repeated. All over. So I have a few options to really do this kind of uh, like small style. The first one is OA in lifestyle, and it will OA have the big git, like the strong git uh, effect. So it is difficult for you to override. And the quick one, the, the pro is basically it's very quick to, to write, but it's yeah, it's messy. The second way is like you can start to really define for one line of CLS you need to define one class. And this will make the code look much structured. And also, because it is encapsulated in the component, you, if you use like scope style in, in React, you don't want to, you don't afraid about this class will be liquid outside. Like you, you have my button using in another places, you don't have to worry about that. And, but this will pose the, the problem because because it is encapsulated, so because I have this, I wanted to reuse this because of portal in many other places. It is not like it had the padding of two and, and margin of four. It is very like, could be reused somewhere. So if you like scope it into the, the component, you won't be able to reuse it. And the last uh, like option that I have is like, I can start to really generalize the pattern when I define the class itself. So I could do a set of component like class name for only cursor. I could do icon dash active for cursor folder or like icon dash default for, I don't know, cursor default or PL dash one for padding left five and PL dot two for padding left 10 pixel, for example. And I mean, of course for this kind of class, I will not like write like manually, I can have like all of the mixing with SAS to help me on that. But I don't know, it is like, if I need, I, I start to build it, I need to document it somewhere so that my team member can reuse it. Because if there's, there's only me in the team, it's easier for me to reuse all of that. But if the, there's a new front end engineer coming, of course, there's the need to be like some reference so that he can uh, refer to and, and start to use it. Otherwise, he will also start to introduce new class and maybe in line style that we don't want. That is when Tailwind come to the places. So Tailwind is like have the very clear documentation on uh, Tailwind CLS. So you go in, you see this uh, example. They just put a bunch of class inside. And all of that, there's the, sorry, there's the, um, uh, convention behind that. So if you want to do H, which is high, it will have the set of uh, predefined. So you need to go through documentation and you just yeah, see what you need to do. Like container, they have all of this container and for SM is for all kind of break, like, like how say it? Break, break, break point on, on the browser. And for this way, they have blog, in like blog, flags, in like flag, and all kind of stuff. So really, I found that sometimes it really helped me to speed up the process. 
But of course, I need to yeah, remember the class and I, I have to work with Tailwind a little bit before. And also, it provided you the, um, yeah, how to, just that's one. So remove it first, how do I open this one? Okay. You remove it? No. Okay, close the tab. It also like giving you the like op like uh, the option for you to customize like what you need to use. So they have the concept of tailwind.config file. Uh, I don't know what is it, but I'm afraid to know. It's not free installation. So inside this tailwind.config.js, you can put a bunch of stuff. I will share with you later because I, I did it for the uh, for the Jira layout, layout, layout. So okay, let's remove it first. So yeah, at the end, I decided to um, mix between SCS and tailwind in in the project itself. But yeah, the, there's a learning curve for new member. So I think at the end, it's worth the effort that we spend a bit of time to go through the uh, documentation of Tailwind and uh, yeah, we can just start from there. Otherwise, you you have to be the one who build the documentation itself. So yeah, there's a, a lot more work to do if you wanted to do it from the start. And, but okay, so when you write a lot of class for a uh, element, you would say, if I have the use case where I wanted to like reuse some of that, Let's say you have a button and you want to write, reuse it. So if you have to have another submit button, you might have to copy a bunch of class over. And you have 10 buttons, you have to copy it 10 times over. And I think it's not easy for like, like, reusable. So Tailwind, I think they understand that is a problem. So they introduce the concept of apply. So that is a special, like, special syntax of Tailwind. So basically, what is that is like you can put in the class name, and magically, when the build process is running, it will take the uh, CLS behind that class name and plug it inside the BTN nest tailwind. So at the end, if you would have another button, you can start to really like uh, share the button across the file. Let's, I think I have this example running, so I don't just use it. So that is the that is the button that uh, generated with um, like only class. So sec. So I go to app module, right? So here I have two buttons. The left side is the one that I created with a bunch of class, which is a lot. You see the background transparent. There's a border blue, which is that one. And also I have the button that use the button tailwind. And if you go to the SCLS file, where I define the, the BTM tailwind, I can see that I just basically I do apply for all of the classes using on the HTML. So you can see it like that. Uh, just break it. So you see that is basically background transfer or like text blue seven like hundred. But for the special um, like state like hover, you cannot do just like uh, hover on something because it is not a valid syntax. So you have to do really like a, another state of hover and then you apply the um, corresponding classes. Like you I do hover on a button and then I apply the background blue five hundred. Then yeah, here I have to do the same. But you have to do with the over, like the sector, the pseudo classes. And I found it is very helpful because uh, on the Jira clone, I also use it for customizing the button. Maybe if I can share it quickly, just go back to this one. So all of this button here is like uh, customized with Tailwind. So this one, for example. But you will go here. Uh, okay, not here, not here. You will go here. This, this button is like blue, which is a primary. So I have, um, I have is, sorry, it's just, this is this is a big project, so it's going to be very messed up. So um, see a control with this button. So inside the button, eh? 
Is it one? Doesn't look. No, it's not input. It is button. Sorry. So also, like for me, I also use the same. So for the the dash bar, the class button, I have a bunch of class, and I also do apply. And when it is uh, disabled, I also do apply. And when you inspect the code, you can see the button. This this button. No. No, this this button. This button has a bunch of like style, which came from this apply. So I don't like I, I don't really write the code like font size uh, uh, fourteen point five pixel. It just take from like text button the class for example, and I think this text button class were defined on the Tailwind dos config somewhere. No, it's not inside. Sorry, <laughs> but yeah, it, uh, just somewhere inside. So yeah, it's really like save you some time because if you have the the predefined configuration, you just apply with your corresponding class, and we will talk about it like shortly. And to configure it with Viewer or React, I think it's easier because they have provided the official guide for that. But for Angular, I I wrote uh, an article by myself. Just do some custom webpack uh, setup, and you you need to do a bit. Yeah, just just to play around with webpack a bit. Maybe it's uh, a bit tricky at the beginning, but it's just easy. So we talk about the layout of uh, Jira clone and how it's built with Tailwind. So do you look at the Jira clone? That's the the three part like the main thing. The three part. There's the navigation on the left side, which is the small one. There's the like um, collapsible sidebar, and then this is a content. So that is a, the blue one is the navigation that I, I just show you. So it's nav, it's navigation. That's that's blue thing. And then I have this collapsible uh, sidebar, which is like 200 something pixel. This one is uh, 60, uh, 64, and the rest is the content. So I the way with Tailwind is like. I define some set of spacing by default. I set the sidebar is like 230 pixel and the nav bar left, which is 64 pixel. And on the when I build the class for that, I'll just do apply and then do uh, w dash nav bar left. So that is the just the the condition like no not the condition it's the uh, it's the uh, syntax is it? like like convention. So you do the w dash and you put it inside of spacing so it will understand that you wanted to uh, refer to this uh, configuration. So you, I uh, inspect the code quickly. I can see that now by left uh, content. Yeah. Okay, let's take a look at the code. I'm not sure where it is. It's maybe not. So it's now by left. And I do apply the uh, W dash now by left. The, the the red underscore is is not nothing you have to worry about. It's just I think it's uh, some kind of uh, style that I configure. So it's just don't like the 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 syntax like that. But basically, I should do apply w nav bar left, and then when you see on the code, this will translate like automatically to with 64 pixel. So you don't really have to really like do with 64 pixel like that. Or you have a variable somewhere. You can do it. Basically, you can do it. Like nav bar left, something like width. But you have to like define all of that into a variable CLS, uh, SCLS file. And I found I if I define inside this JS, more or less the same. Like I do it with variable on SCLS. So I think it's, it's more like the the preference, like how you build the the layout. But I like it better because if I yeah, just the same. If I need to change it to maybe not 64 anymore, it could be like 100. I'll just come to the tailwind select. Just change this number left to 100, and I view it, run view, and that's it. It will just the UI will update automatically. It will be very similar when I, you change it on the SCLS variable. But yeah, that is just I think just like preference and. When I use Tailwind, I'll just try to utilize Tailwind. Yeah, I have also there's some variable here. 
and there's a machine to do a background and to do a button. Yeah, but um, yeah, that's, that's what I just uh, talk about. But you might wondering because Tailwind is like preparing all of the class, which is like a lot, like floor, uh, of sizing a lot. So if we included it into the bundle, it could be resulting in the huge bundle JavaScript when we load it. When we serve it to the user and uh, Tailwind, they, they by default they have the perk option. Perk is like uh, like perk, so you can throw this controlling file size. And yeah, it is like with when it's uncompressed, it's like too much. And when minifies like still one max, and when it's zip still like a lot. So basically, you just need to enable this option, which is perk. And it will go through when the, the view process kick in, it will go through all of the HTML file and then check to see what like real like in in what is like actually using, like what class is actually using on your project. So that it will remove all of the unnecessary class. For example, if I only do uh like like what? Like display, for example. So if I only use uh, flex and table, basically all of this block and inline block and inline flex will not be included in the, the final CLS file. That is quite useful. And uh, I did a quick test with the, this uh, project, the, the Tailwind, because I just have some button and some margin here and there. And uh, at the end, the uh, result were quite good. But I need to see where is it. Uh, just give me a moment. Just, just, just. So you will enable the the perks option. It will step away. Why is it? Sorry, it's a bit. Yes, should be somewhere. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So, so when I I bundle the file, the CSS file, which is at the beginning is is too big, like one mesh. But when I enable the perks, it's basically just two kilobytes, which is very small. So yeah, I, it is. Uh, you don't have to really worry about the the uh, bundle file size when you work with Tailwind because they they provide it for you. And yeah, let's continue with this uh, slide. So for more of my like personal recommendation, I would just yeah, recommend Tailwind to to use it, but really depend on like what is your preference and uh, how we gonna shape your your project. So we talk about like state management a bit because uh, just now is about more the layout, the front end side. So um, when I start to build a project, I mean I work with I I H S so. Akita and IHS is, I think it, they inherit the Redux concept quite like they follow the Redux approach. So um, when you have the complicated app with a lot of data flowing around and when you seeing that when you communicate between the component, there's, there's a gap between, there's just too many layer and you start to communicate between like sibling component. It is when you, you need the um, state management. And I used NGIX in a lot of projects in, in, in Xylem. And to be honest, uh, it is not an easy concept to, to understand at the beginning. And I'll, on this project, I start to use Akita. And let's see how. So it is basically NGIX flow. You would always have the reducer somewhere, which do own a like, switch space, like switch space. On, do all of two all of the action and really handle the state. And you have a big store. Uh, just consider a store is like a big object somewhere. And on the component, you you select it, like select the data from the store. But when the, the problem is like when I started to want to fetch the data in NGIX, they introduced the concept of effect, which means that they don't want to the component to know all about HTTP and all kind of stuff in the component itself. So there should be another, like somebody else, like someone else, just somewhere. They do all of the 
HTTP is fast and um, they update the store at the end, update the, like, update the reducer and then update the store at the end. And I found that is very tricky to understand. Also, for me, I, I get it, like, eventually I get it, but for some of my uh, team members, it's just difficult for them because, yeah, it is difficult concept. So, yeah, why not? And here is, I, it is just my like, personal like preference. So maybe you I might not really agree, so we can like, discuss about it at the end of the present. So let's talk about how I, I, I really need to, to start with NGX. So I need to create a set of action, which is, uh, I don't know, from load and load success, load something success, and then load something error. And for all of the results, I need to like, just repeat the process. I found that. I don't get really fancy of that because just a lot of volume plate need to write. And on the reducer itself, I feel like using sweet play a lot. It is just not for me. It's just not the concept for me. But um, I, I understand that the NGRX team has um, really like um, introducing new uh, syntax to shorten the, the code that needs to be right. And um, after you write the reducer, you need to put it into the store module, which is very like Angular concept. In React, maybe you need to do something else, but in Angular, everything has to be um, imported into a module at the end. So it's for root, meaning it needs to be an, on a very top level of the application. And from all of the components, you need to create, like select from the store, or you need to uh, create the selector like a dependency injection like the service and you can query data from service and yeah when, when you need to do something you call dispatch to dispatch an action and that is the part I, I should talk about about the effect so when you need to fetch data because the team they wanted to disconnect the HTTP they call it side effect from the component itself so there will be somebody which call effect to handle it so we also need to dispatch when you go to the application, you still need to dispatch the action to load the data. But then the load data will be listening into the effect. And then in the effect itself, they will start to really handle all of the HTTP requests and, and all of the success and error from there. And on the component itself, you query to the, the, the selector. And once the effect update the selector, then you have it on the component. I think for normal use case, it is easy to, to work with, but just a lot of code needs to be written. And also, when there's an error, it is just difficult to choose where is the root code. And I just, yeah, don't, don't like it. And yeah, because my team is consisting of my and there's uh, myself and some of the junior front end, so. When they're joining in, they just don't even know what is jQuery or AngularJS, so they need to understand a lot of concept with Angular because it's not just very simple, like just a component like React, but also there's EDI and the IJS and Observable and a lot of stuff. And when I introduced NGX, they still need to learn a lot of stuff as well. So I think if you have some experience, easy for you, but for the new one, NGX is just not something very intuitive at the beginning. And we talk about Akita later. So I, I will share some of the code I'm comparing uh, between NGI and Akita so we can really in the same place. Uh, yeah, so let's just show you some of the code. Maybe easier. So I share you some of my code in Xylem first. Um, so there's the store. So I need to define the reducer. So let's say I have this context reducer, which I need to define the state based on an interface just to have a type. And reducer basically just the big function that do own kind of switch case. And for each uh, um, type of action, you will have to uh, like handle it differently for, for each kind of action. Um, but let's go back to the action. So there's, there's few actions. Yeah, so always there's a lot and then lot success and uh, there's load failure and also there's load filter and also load filter succeed and you, you have another uh, resource this could be another set of three action at least could be uh, load something and load uh, something succeed and load something failure which is okay it's not succeed that I like 
And the thing is, that's tricky is like, is this effect? Because when I call the loss action, let's go back to this action. Um, so I need to call it somewhere. I do dispatch new. Yeah, I have the context. I have the facet. So facet is like just to abstract the store so that in the future, I can just easily replace this uh, store implementation with something else. Because if you inject this store into every single component, it will be difficult in the future. If you wanted to migrate this um, uh, NGI, like migrate the uh, state management to you a different library, uh, for example, it could be Akita or NGIS. So I introduce the, the facet. The facet, so basically, it's just another layer of abstraction where you can uh, talk, query data, and dispatch data. So I don't dispatch it directly from the store in the component. I do it through the facet. So what is that? It's like the component will go through the facet and then con load. And then in the load of the facet, it will call the actual load action. And because um, the action here is like defining so that the effect can handle. So you need to go to the effect. So on the effect itself, it will listen to all kind of action. So every action dispatch will go through the effect. And if it is in the type of load, you will go through this function to actually make the request to the server. And then you start to dispatch the success and the failure action. So when the so when the success is updating the store, basically on the component you can start to uh, query from this collection. I do it like that everywhere. But when it's failure, it is get tricky. So yeah, for my screen, when I got some error with with uh, with effect, it just couldn't get like to the place where I can recover from it. So I I this uh, I'm not really recommend to use it. Uh, so it is about NGX. So for Akita, it is a bit like I would say maybe much more simpler. So you don't have to define own own kind of action. Basically, you just need to define the, the store, and then you need to define a query, and from your service, like for from your service to call to the HTTP server, you can update the store from there. So let me open the code where I do this uh, project. Store. So to the side. So there's a state. So there's a project folder which inside the state. So there's a store. Very simple. I have an user and the land, and this could has something which is which has a lot of data. It's just a, basically an an object of uh, a, a project. So which is that one? Uh, this one. This how. This how UI is serving from the, the single source. So all of this issue is coming from this uh, LAN, and then inside LAN is each LAN consists of like several issues. This LAN consists of several like uh, several LAN, and in each LAN is considered of like several issue project issue. So for Agita, you just define the the state simply. And you uh, just uh, create like when you, the the project is initialized, you just create the initial state, and from the service itself, that is interesting. You just inject the the store, and then you you have the store, and you can start to use it when you do get project. When I just go to the server, I do this fetch, which means to go to the server and have some data, and then when the the, the 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 process is succeed. I'll just update the store immediately. I don't need to dispatch any kind of action. So somebody will handle it. I'll just update the store immediately after I have data. And if the uh, everything is is finished, I'll just do set loading, which is uh, set the the the, the loading um, state of the store. So they have. Uh, Error and, and loading is built in. So when you define this store, basically you have the loading like state and also the error state. So you don't have to define it on this initial state anymore. The it is like included when you define it. And I found it very like intuitive. It is like the flow that I think when I write code, I have some data, I update the store, 
and when the store have some data, which is the query kicking. So you can uh, just inject the store, and then you start to select own bunch of stuff. And this is when we turn you in uh, some kind of observable. So observable is just the just the representation of like um, the data could come in the future. It's like promise, but instead of promise, it return a single data observable. We just and we keep sending data over time. So when you have this observable, when you listen to it somewhere, when there's a new data on the store, get updated and you use immutable, right? You update the object reference. It will really send the 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 send the update to you. So you can do okay. I don't do this here, but let's say you can do subscribe and you have the user here. So every time, every single time the user array, this one is updated and there's a new reference of the array on the store, it will kick in and you know the data here inside. So you really like make the component pure so you don't really need to depend on the component on the chain detector of the, the framework itself to update the UI. You can really have the data and then uh, tell the, co the, 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 the component to render it or like check it rendering on the UI. So it will be faster because comparing like uh, object reference is much faster than if the, the, the library have to really go deep into every single property and see if there's any change on the UI or, or change on the data and then they update the UI. It will be much more expensive if you do it. So I yeah, I think it's just the basic idea of um, of how state management work and Agita is doing it very well for me. And I really like it. And uh, the next one is the very end of this uh, talk today. So after I, I build on the, the stuff, I need to deploy somewhere. So I choose Nellyfy. So Nellyfy basically is like static file hosted. So after you run npm, you, you will have uh, some kind of HTTP and Java 3, I don't know, HTTP. HTML and JavaScript and CSS, all of the static file content, you can host it in Netlify. So it's very simple. You just connect it to the GitHub repository and you put in the build command. And then that's it. After you push to, to master, it will automatically build the, 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 the project for you and then it will serve it in, on the UI. So I do a lot of Netlify on, on my personal account. So I have this Jira, which is doing. So to set up is quite simple. You just need to supply the view, which is you connect it to repository, and you select the like what branch you want to build uh, when there's a push uh, commit, and just do a command and then select the uh, distribution folder, and that is what you see on the screen. This one. This one is the result from this view. So if now I commit a chain on, on the repository, uh, repository sorry, um, I push it to, to master. And then, of course, they will start to do uh, view here. But if I deep, like, like push another commit on another branch, so it try to do the deploy review, which means they're trying to view this the new commit in another branch to see if it really like get you succeed on the server because sometimes you never know when you do be on the server they need to re restore all of the npm from the scratch and then maybe one of the library you are using is removed so it could be failure you will never know so that is this deploy review and it's very helpful i guess and uh, another thing I'm using to publish the web is like I using like Heroku. So I have the Nest uh, JS API, which is deployed to Heroku. So basically, Nellyfy is only to host the static file like HTML or JS CSS. But if you need a server which is running 24/7 and always listening to a, a request from the client. You cannot do it with Nellyfy. So that is Heroku will come in. And I'll just uh, to, to it. maybe Daniel will have a better explanation about Heroku later. But I'll just use this for first time to deploy 
my simple API for this uh, Jira clone. So it is the Jira clone API. And it's very simple. You so need to connect to a res like repository and uh, set up the view command. And after that, it just every time you push, let me tr trigger the view, like the process for you. And uh, yeah, that's it. I think I have the domain of the if API, even I don't use it. So if you go there, you can see that is the simple API. I just put the text here, and you will slash project. It will just give me a text like a JSON, so that I can get it from there, and then I'll just render it on the UI. Very simple. It is not like posting, and I, I need to connect to any database at the moment. It's very simple. It's just the, the fixed structure of the data all the time. And uh, that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, I think uh, that's it. I think this has been a, a long talk, and uh, now is the Q&A. And I don't know why the Q&A is just trying to trigger the animation. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, uh, I'll finish and uh, I hope that you enjoy it and I, uh, you I learn something from it, maybe. And uh, you have any question, it's now the time to talk. That's cool. Thank you, Chong. Uh, thanks, Before Harry. you guys have any question, go to the report and give him a star. Oh, yeah, 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 okay. Let, 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 let me do it. Quickly. You, you don't have to remember the GitHub URL. You just do jira.chunkaetin.com. Oh, now there's four. Okay. On the right side, I have prepared you a, <laughs> a button. So you just click into it, and there's a star. Okay, so now it's almost 1,000. I would appreciate if it could reach 1,000 soon in the future. But anyway. <laughs> so any question, anyone? And the idea about the stage management, like what you are using, and maybe you have something to share about that? My question is actually on Tailwind. Yep. Also, a really good um, talk. You don't, it's like not every day you see someone giving you insights into a really big project or a project of this size, like all the way from um, UI to the back end and state management and even deployment. So I think really good range. Um, so you mentioned, like I, I use Tailwind also. Um, mm. I'm, I'm, I really like the utility first approach. So I think like you mentioned, as the project grows, it gets really hard to keep track of the classes. Uh, so if someone new is looking at the code base, they're just seeing a bunch of PT is two and MX is five and um, and a bunch of really new class names. How have you like? How would you approach documenting that? Oh, I see. I mean, usually I don't just uh, if I use Tailwind, I I don't do my uh, own class, so I just don't document it. And I just ask my team to go to Tailwind documentation and see the the reference from them. I think they have a very good documentation on everything. So usually I don't have a lot of customization. So for Jira. I just have this uh, spacing for the nav and like navigation bar and the size bar. And yeah, I think that's it. The rest are just using like by default of Tailwind. So I just ask my team members to first uh, look at Tailwind, how they're doing, like just get the idea from that. We can do a bit of uh, coding together. And then what he needs to do is just to refer to this form, to the to the Tailwind configuration somewhere. And you're from there. He can really graph what it's like. He can use, if he has some basic knowledge of Tailwind. Yeah, that is my approach. Because I just don't really have a, put it into a company uh, work. So it is usually my outside of the, uh, of the scope. <laughs> so that's only me and a few uh, of my friends who are also very familiar with Tailwind. So there's no problem for them to, to get started from there. Uh, yeah, no, I, I get that. that. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Yeah. Um, again, really good, uh, really good talk. I'm starring your repo right now. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions, anyone? So you mentioned that 
um, you use Nest.js, you started yep. Nest.js and then you kind of dumb it. Yeah, sure. Are you going to consider using Strapi now? Yeah, actually, I mean, I, 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 would, I would plan to talk about it. So you see that is a phase two of the project, uh, which is yeah, you like crazy code, you see. You see the API. My friend, he needs to define all of the detail and all of the crazy stuff to get, like speed up the GraphQL, which is on NetJS. And with Strapi, it's just like you run the command and it's running on the server. You have even the UI to to see the data, which is fun. I don't know, but my friend have put a lot of effort into this uh, NetJS V2, uh, so <laughs> swapping it is, uh, I don't know. <laughs> All of you can have code. both versions running if you want. Maybe, <laughs> yes, I'm maybe phase three then, Daniel. <laughs> so. And actually, I'll talk about it because there's a there's a question at the beginning. Talk about the mono repo. I think it's worth mentioning, like because on the phase two. Okay, so let's let let's show you guys the code of the first one. The first one is I also host the front end and the back end in the same repository, but it's just two separated folders. There's no connected between. And I don't know, I feel like there's a lot of things could be shared between the two packet.json file. Like if you use uh, Lodash in both back end and front end, you can share it. So um, I have started to look at this uh, and I just work straight. So it is. Uh, they they provide uh, some built-in stuff for a mono repo. Basically, like what I have inside this this phase two folder is like there's only one folder which consists of several applications, which is the API is written on NetJS. The Jira clone is written in uh, Angular and TypeScript. I could also put another application which is using ReactJS, and when I run it. Uh, Usually, uh, I start the Jira clone and I will try to break all of the share module, like share, let's say, like share interface or data model into a folder inside this lib thing. And from there, I can import it in both the API on and the front end. So you don't need to copy the definition file, TypeScript file over, you just share it via a library and then you can use it in both like front end and back end. I think it's quite, I mean, not quite, it's, it's super helpful. And you can start to introduce all kinds of stuff, React, Angular, many stuff, maybe Vue.js in the future. And yeah, it's just, just my take on that. But it's, uh, it is a bit of work to set it up at the beginning and you might need to have a, a better understanding of everything to, to really get it like, started. But after that, everything will be easier for you. If you have a mono repo set up. Yeah, I just share that. That's it. And so if anyone don't have any like, question, I'll just share my uh, latest. You can also give me a sign if you would like to. So it's just basically it's a game I also write, uh, written with Angular and uh, TypeScript. It's was based on uh, a view project, but the brand of the game, all of the game loop, all of this, how the piece is uh, running, it will customize written on, on TypeScript. So if you uh, want to play it, you can go to this TypeScript.com or from the Jira, you can have the link, just the button, you can click it, and you will immediately go to the game, yeah. and I hope you like it. Yeah, that's it, too much for me. I hope, I think, talk so much today. Any question, anyone? Or uh, if not, then uh, Eric, you, you have the control. Yeah, so... Um